Hi there, I'm Dr. Mirdalis Diaz Ramirez, and this is the Design Your Physician Life podcast, brought to you by our Max Seller Mastermind, a personal professional development program for physicians who want to learn about entrepreneurship. Today, we have a wonderful guest, Rami Elgendor. He's actually the CEO of Arcelate, and we are going to be talking about how to make it to the boardroom. Are you ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Design Your Physician Life podcast, where you will get excited about being a physician, learn the tools that can help boost your success, and great tips from successful doctors. Join us to unlock the keys to an amazing physician life. And now, here's your host, Dr. Mirdalis Diaz Ramirez. So guys, we're here, very excited to have Rami Elkendor today. We are here to answer the question, how to get to the boardroom? Because these pain physicians, they want to know, you know, how is it that historically so many men have been there? And then if there's any things that we can do as physicians to position ourselves in, in a way that we're going to be able to be part of that decision making for different companies, um, tech companies. Um, before we get into that, I really want to uh, highlight the work that you've done to create not even not only equity but even beyond equity in the you know in the boardroom and the companies that you've worked um you know you've, you've talked about this we've seen lectures from you we've seen tech talk from you and um you've won prizes uh, for this so thank you for being here no it's my pleasure it's nice to see you again we were just talking uh before we got on here the last time we saw each other was in ocala florida and i was giving a talk on diversity and you were very kind enough to come and attend it was really really great to see you then um, look, I think you're you're trying to tackle a bunch of different challenges. The first one is it's generally hard to get on boards. And then two, as talk about in that talk and, and a lot of other times, like it's generally harder for women to get into those opportunities because a lot of times recruiters, board members, they want someone who's done it before. And so um, I think the first thing we have to do is sort of overcome that challenge and present, uh, not focus on the totality of experience that one needs to get on that board, but focus on like the direct impact that the person can bring to that opportunity. And that's kind of how I often break through these cycles and hire a lot of women and get them on boards. Um, it's that, you know, what are we trying to solve for? Let's not try to, you know, boil the ocean, as they say, and try to solve every problem under the sun. Is there a specific experience set? Is there a specific um, topic or area of focus that we have and does this person have the skill set and have the background to help us in this area and so when you kind of break it down like that i think that can help overcome some of these uh biases but getting into the topic i think there's two types of boards so let's clarify the question first there's like boards of directors of companies and i'm not aware of a lot of physicians getting onto boards of directors of companies whether in the pain space or anyone else but i can come back to that if that's the area of interest. And then there's advisory boards. And there's tons of physicians on a lot of advisory boards. Um, and most of them happen to be men. So if that is the topic of conversation, I think I can probably give a little bit more advice on how to do that than the first one, because the first one, I'm, unless you correct me, uh, I'm not sure there are a lot of physicians in general, men or women on company boards. So before we go into the advisory board question, um, Let's give a little bit of background because some people might not know who we're talking to, right? Uh, Rami, uh, he has been the in the the time that I met you was at C as CEO of a neuromodulation company called Nevro, and um, so since then you've been CEO of other companies. Right now you're actually so. Let's let's talk about a little bit of your background. What why are we asking you the question? Um, and besides that, while you were on Nevro. Uh, in, in inside Nevro, what happened that made um, you speak more about this topic during that period of time? And then we'll get into that other question. Sure. Yeah. So quick background. So I'm an engineer by training and I actually, my first job was also in neuromodulation uh, when ANS was ANS before it was acquired by St. Jude and then Abbott. So I was an ANS engineer. I worked on the first rechargeable uh, system that was ever made um, by ANS, I guess. Uh, maybe it was the first one, period. I think we actually I did work on the first rechargeable neurostimulator. Boston Scientific came up with one shortly thereafter, and then Medtronic years later. Um, 
so that was my first job. And then I went to business school and then got into venture capital. Um, if you're not familiar with venture capital, but you've seen Shark Tank, it's just like Shark Tank. So I used to, but not investing my own money, other people's money, but I invested in, in, in venture. And so I actually sat on 15 boards in, in the five years I was in venture capital. So I'm pretty familiar with that um, with that world. And then that from there, I jumped to Nevro and I built Nevro from about 30 to 1,000 people. When I started, it was a tiny company. We were just commercializing in Europe, um, hadn't run our pivotal study yet. And uh, we ran that RCT and two more after that that were successful and built that company over about a seven year period. And it was super fun. And that's why where I got to know Mirdell. Um, and then uh, I left there and took a couple of years off and caught up on some sleep and some time with family and going to car shows and doing TED Talks and that kind of thing. And then I now uh, I'm chairman and CEO of a company called Arcelix. Uh, we're a biotechnology company that makes cancer therapeutics, specifically something called CAR T therapy, which is a cutting edge therapy in the field of cancer or oncology. So that's a little bit of my story. I've been at this company for about two years. Also, incidentally, joined. I was about the 30th person. I think I was the 33rd person at Arcelix um, and took the company public. And it's been a super, super fun journey, especially in, in that field. Um, obviously, it's life-saving therapies, and it's been super fun. So that's my background. So we'd say that you know a little bit of what you're talking about. And then um, during your your time in Nevro, uh, you were actually recognized for your work in trying to bring you know, working, actually, not trying, but really working on, on uh, purposefully on uh, creating equity and uh, in your company and across uh, the space. Tell us a little bit about what inspired you to get that, um, that in that route, uh, what things you saw, what things you've been uh, talking about, and then eventually, um, if you've seen any changes um, as a result of your work. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So in terms of that, I mean, we were recognized for ha like for being one of the best companies for women. And um, we I think we we helped start the women in neuromodulation group and support that a lot and try to have influence and in making sure that women were represented in research and on panels and and boards and so on and try to use our position in the industry to help uh, make a positive influence there. Um, and, you know, I, I get that question a lot. I think it's a combination of things. I think one, you know, my mom was a really strong person and, and an entrepreneur, and she really raised me in a way that I thought anything was possible and not to be biased. And so I, I want to remember, but I feel like my first three or four hires at Nevro were all women and they were all superstars. And, um, I think, uh, I don't know, I got sort of a reputation for hiring exceptional women and that kind of spread and, and helped us build like really exceptional teams. Um, but I think I started speaking about it partly because I, I started to realize more and more as I advanced in my career, how many biases and impediments there were for women um, to advance. I think when you're kind of more uh, earlier in your career, you're a little bit more just focused on yourself and trying to learn and advance and um and you're a little bit more sheltered like you don't really have perspective into the broader industry and what's working and not working and what are the challenges but i think when as you get into more positions of leadership you can start seeing more and recognizing more and i tend to read a lot and i particularly read i tend to read more research than i read books and so i read a lot of research on the topic and so a combination of like my uh, you know, kind of how I was raised, my personal experience, my professional experience, and the research I read kind of got me to recognize that this is a really significant problem and uh, one that I felt like I was in a position to try to help with. So um, I think that was kind of the genesis of, of talking about it more. That's where I put together this talk about um, gender equity. So when I was at Nevro, every year I used to put together a talk on the thing that like impacted me the most, or I learned the most the prior year that had nothing to do with work necessarily. So one year I talked about gender equity, but one year I talked about mindfulness. One year I talked about the meaning, kind of like the meaning of life, like happiness versus meaning. Um, one year I talked about stoicism. So it's sort of just 
I would read a lot and I would learn something and try to share it with my colleagues. And so that's kind of where I put that talk together and it impacted people so much that they encouraged me to like talk about it outside of the company. And so that's kind of where the, the genesis of that talk and that advocacy came from as well. Yeah, we're super manning all of these. I'm trying to think, you know. I know I don't have my I don't I don't have my my <laughs> Superman shirt on today. I have my co my Cobra Kai shirt on today. <laughs> I'm disappointed. <laughs> Anyways, so um so from that work, you were you won some prizes, you know, you were you won recognition for for this work. And I have to tell you that the first time I saw so many pain management female female pain management physicians was at never. I had never been to an event before where I saw so many women and I really got scared. Like I looked around me living in the world as a pain management physician and it truly, it was um, really impressive to me to see so many women together and you had them there. And that's, that's some, some work that was really, um, it has changed my life. I have to tell you, I never have told you that, um, but it really brought me to a different level of, of, of understanding. And, and a sisterhood that we're now so, you know, so many friends. And it was because of that event that, that you guys put together. Now, um, talking about changes in the, you know, you work at a different company. And I would guess that you brought similar um, situations, similar ways of hiring. And I remember when you were talking about hiring things that the companies can do themselves to, to bring that equity, right? There are certain things, you know, how you expand your um your pool of people how you make sure that that you bring candidates and you open to them um so that's from the company point of view let's talk about how physicians themselves can better position you know doesn't matter if it's a woman or a man you know the thing is going to be at the end the same thing you're going to still have to require certain uh, skills and certain things that you're going to have to know because Communi uh, companies like that communicate differently than physicians do in our training, right? So there are certain things that you have to learn, certain skills, as they say, that you're looking. So let's talk about that for, for the first type of board. And then we'll, we'll also talk about why physicians don't make it to the, don't only make it to the advisory board, but they don't make it to the, to the board room on the sure, other side. Yeah. Well, maybe let's start with that. I mean, getting like company boards, especially. So there's two different types of company boards at the highest level. There's like startup company boards and big company company boards. So we can all take off the big company company boards because that's just, you know, no one's getting on the Medtronic board or the, you know, Novartis board or whatever. Um, I don't want to crush anyone's dreams, but the odds are not super high. So startup boards tend to be dominated by investors. That's really the simple reason why um uh positions don't get on men or women and when they do have non-investors on they tend to have like ceos on because again think about what's relevant like if you're building a startup most of them fail there's a lot of challenges you want people on who can help that startup navigate those challenges um and so generally you they tend to go for people who've kind of been there done that and they've built other star startups and they have the experience and kind of can help them navigate so that kind of leaves advisory boards and i you know unfortunately the advisory boards are kind of especially in the pain space dominated um largely uh by men um and so if you think about what is needed on an advisory board from the company perspective because it's industry who puts these together um they want people who are either strong in research strong in societies or strong in like their communication skills right so why are those things important you want people who are strong in research because presumably a startup in healthcare for it to make a progress and get to market will have to run some clinical studies I know that's not the strength of the pain industry in our experience, but nevertheless, it is the path forward. And so typically some, some subset of an advisory board is going to have to be people who are experienced in research and can help the company really guide it as it makes decisions around clinical studies and patient populations and things like that. 
you're going to, they're going to want people who are active in societies because they're going to want avenues to be able to present their data um, and influence. And that's probably my least favorite part about the pain space. It's totally different in oncology, by the way. Um, it doesn't matter it's who you medicine. Know. Isn't yeah. medicine all the same? It's not the same. Um, in oncology, it doesn't matter who, you know, who ran the study or who you know. It's just the data is the data, and that's how things are determined. That wasn't my experience in the pain space. But in any event, societies, like so influence in societies makes a difference. Um, and then communication skills. There are people who aren't involved in societies and maybe are not super involved in research. But again, in medical medical devices, I would say in general, not specific to pain, you know, you have to kind of get the word out there and you've got to be able to influence people and, and help communicate the message around the technology and the data and all of that. So having people who are who can kind of have that kind of influence and peer influence um, is really valuable. So I think those are kind of the one kind of the bottoms up, if you will, way to think about how do I get on an advisory board? It's generating skills in one of those three areas that would make one attractive to an advisory board. The top down view is like, how do people get selected for those things? Well, they get selected by in two ways. They get selected either by industry, like somebody at a company you know, recognizes a person's talent for X, Y, or Z and asks them, or they get pulled in by their peers, right? You pull in one physician and they say, you know, who else is really great? You should be talking to this person. So it's a really complicated problem to solve because research, you can maybe control yourself. Like if you, um, at your own practice, um, you can try to, you know, start up a research um, component to it, or you can join a practice that has research, but it takes a lot of work and investment. You have to hire a research coordinator and you have to invest some of your own capital. And, you know, and then it's a, a little bit of like, you've got to go out and be like an entrepreneur. You are an entrepreneur anyway, like all doctors and entrepreneurs that are running their, or most of them are, they're running their own practices. That changed. That, that, that changed. changed right now. Most of us over 50% are employed. employed yeah. But you, you go out and like hunt essentially for, for trials, like talk to companies and see who's out there and get involved. So I think that can help make a name. Um, the society part is really hard. Like, I think there has to be like fundamental change. And that to your point, what Nerdellis, the thing that you mentioned about Nevro, that honestly was the most power, one of the most powerful days in my life in general, not just in my career when we brought all those women together. Because you heard, so it was so impactful and you heard so many great stories. And the most powerful thing was exactly what you said, which is recognizing that you're not alone, that there are a lot of people like you, um, and there is power in that. And so I do think it's not solvable by any single woman necessarily. Never say never, because there's a lot of badass women out there. But I think as a group approaching these societies and saying, hey, we need a seat at the table, like we want to see balanced panels. Like we want to see balanced boards at these societies. We want to see balanced opportunities to present and pushing for that. That I think is a long-term kind of macro solution that will help drive opportunities for women. Because if you're on these society boards and you're on these panels and you're doing these presentations, that's where you get the visibility to industry that helps facilitate that those conversations that lead to ad boards. The last one around like communication, I think that's a local thing. Like if you invest in relationships locally, if you invest in relationships with your peers and try to get published and all that kind of stuff, and that gives you sort of regional or local or even macro influence, that can be a helpful way to get on ad boards too. So I'll stop there. That's a lot to take. So you might have a lot, a lot to follow up on, but kind of just wanted to lay all of it out. That's that's in my experience how those things work and where there are opportunities that either someone can control themselves or maybe as a group, um, it could be done. Well, you know, as you said, like right now, you said it yourself, um, when you stop a Nebro, right? Um, you took a two year vacation, right? A pause because you were trying to get some sleep trying to get some family time and just to get, you know, one of, 
at least the first two challenges on women who want to have a family, um, spend some time with the family, um, just, just a matter of time so that you're not, so that you can take care of your kids, um, which is uh, historically mainly done by the women, right? Um, that puts you at a disadvantage there. You're not traveling for, um, you know, to go to all these meetings necessarily, to be able to go and, and present at all these meetings and do all these things. Mostly it's men who are, who are doing that. I'm seeing a little bit more of women taking those roles right now in the pain management world. And with WIPM, the new society, you know, it's, it's newer, that is being changed but there's a lot of that where men uh, historically have had the support of their partners or wives to be able to take care of the family and then do the other thing. So that's a big challenge there. In terms of uh, relationships for people who are talking locally, you know, as you say, with the communication skills, just getting, hey, you know, to get to know me. Um, what would be like an entry point? Because I can see an entry point for the research point of view. Or from the, it, it's it's you know it takes time and the effort and and going through the through all these things where, as a, physicians, we're more familiar with attending meetings and presenting and getting research and all that stuff. That's part of the job, you know, the, to in, to many of us. But in the part, the third entry point of communication, these relationships, like where do you build those relationships outside of? necessarily in a research or going to meetings? Yeah, so I think there's a couple of ways. That one is trickier for sure. So one, like for example, if it is a challenge to travel to the big meetings, don't you don't have to go to all of them, right? Like I think picking one or two a year is good. But what I meant by like maybe like joining the regional society in your area, right? Like so whether it's Texas Pain or I forget KSIP or whatever the local society is, like that's a lot more manageable, like it's less travel, it's local, you get to build sort of relationships and influence around that region. So I think that's one way. I think to the extent you do like referral marketing, um, and and sort of develop, like you can develop sort of the communication that way. But you're right, that one is a little bit harder. It's harder to be found out and to be sort of considered um, for an ad board because of that value you bring on the local level. But I think for those, to your point, who don't necessarily have the support and the opportunity to do the other things, it's still potentially like you can sort of play in your own backyard and build a name for yourself and um, and and get there that way. In your career, have you seen women physicians get to the advisory board? Yeah, I mean, for sure. I mean, I mean, for us, like for me, I mean, we try to make it a priority. Not not just women, but physicians, women physicians. On advisory boards. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, most people on advisory boards are physicians. So, uh, but yeah, absolutely. I just think it's not to the degree that it should be. Uh, and that's why we're having this conversation. <laughs> and tell us about those women who who you found, um, if you can give us some example of, of someone you can remember, you don't have to mention names, but what do you remember about their career that made them get there? And um, compared to men, were they there like at the same time that a man would normally be, you know, historically, maybe a man gets to this age and then a woman gets a different age or, you know, for, for these women that you've seen on advisory boards, what, how, how has it been for them? to get there. Yeah, I mean I would say on the age front they were generally younger um than their uh male counterparts. Um and they came from all of those buckets that I'm talking about. Like some of them had never been on a society but had developed like a really strong local reputation so when you ask around in that region they're like hey yeah this is the person that's really well respected and well known and has kind of local influence. Some of them were academic neuro, neurosurgeons or like very, you know, they had kind of the pedigree, right? Like they're at the right institutions and the, you know, they is super experienced and they're super published and all of that. And then some of them were like your classical. Um, sometimes they check the society box too. Like they were on a society board and, um, and they, um, 
could sort of help guide and navigate and and those kind of things. Um, but yeah, I feel like uh, I mean I've I've seen I've seen women get there from all of those buckets that we're talking about across. Um, I guess in in my current field, it's just really much more about like there's so few centers who do what we do that the people who do it, like we just had an advisory board and there were a lot of women there. Now, granted, it is an area of focus for us, but it's also not like super hard because there are are just super women and some of the key institutions that, that do this. What we're focused on is like we had a panel and we just made sure we had you know, equal representation on that panel and, and that kind of thing. So um, I do think it's harder in pain, not because there aren't a lot of great women, but because like the most likely paths, which are like trials and society seem to be mostly dominated by men. That are not letting go right now. <laughs> they never seem to let go. <laughs> You gotta, you know, what is that expression? Nobody hands you anything. You gotta take it. <laughs> the okay, so there is something that's to get there, right? So we get there. You have the research. You have the society. You have the communication. Boom! You're selected. You're, you know, you you fought for it, and you're there. Let's talk about thriving within a panel, within a, a panel, no, within within the board. Which once you're there, there's going to be different characteristics and things that we need to, to be able not to only arrive, but to stay there. Um, what things have you seen that normally they might not have taught us in medical school that you think are like crucial to be able to thrive in one of these boards? Yeah, I mean, I honestly, I think lo- do- doctors have it really hard because they only train you to be a doctor, but you really need to be a business person and an entrepreneur and a CEO and communication specialist and a networker and all sorts of things that they don't teach you. Um, so I'm generally really impressed with how you all pick those things up and apply them like in real time. Um, it's, it's really, it's really impressive. Um, but the things on an ad board that are, are going to help that are kind of intangible, because like you said, most of them will come and they already have good communication skills and good clinical skills and all of that. So I think having the context of what is important from the company's perspective, like showing up on an ad board and being like super academic and not recognizing that companies can only take certain risks and, you know, they can't run studies that are, you know, that are likely to fail or that are in indications that are super tiny because it's not going to, there's not going to be a good return and, and those kind of things. So having context is really, really hard to teach in, um, in the business world and, and could be an impediment because what you don't want to do is show up there and like, you know, the approach you're taking is just kind of mismatched with what needs to what needs to happen. So I think that's one, you know, two is just being confident. Um, it's kind of almost like the opposite of the first one. It's like, despite maybe not having all the context. You know, you got to be confident because these the, the the dudes that are on these boards are not unfortunately lacking in confidence and they are often wrong, but never in doubt. So, um, you know, making sure that you do share your voice and that, you know, um, you bring the perspective that you were brought on to bring and not kind of shying from debate or that kind of thing, I think is really important. Um I think those are kind of the two big ones that are a little bit intangible, right? They're not really related to like a particular experience, but I've seen both of those things be uh, be a challenge. So suppose that somebody from the pain world wants to cross to the cancer world <laughs> and be on that board, that they're great communicators, they're great socialists. <laughs> Would that be a possibility? <laughs> It's too complicated. I, I I barely <laughs> learned as much as I could in the last two years. It is, especially cancer. I mean, first of all, there's so many different types of cancer. Our initial indication is in multiple myeloma. And just the treatment options in multiple myeloma, it, it's so undefined and so rapidly changing. And there's so much investment in the field. Um, it's, I mean, look, what, you know, it's funny when recruiters were calling me 
to try to get me back out to take another CEO role, they kept on asking me what I wanted. And I kept on saying complexity, like I want something complex. Um, and boy, did I get what I asked for. It is super, super complex, but it's super fun. Well, that's awesome. That's awesome. Tell me um, something that, um, a, a question, like when you're interviewing somebody for a position like this, which sort of questions are we expecting to get, you know, particularly, you know, not only like your background and all this stuff, but some of the questions that you will ask just to test personality, just to test if they would be a good part for your team. Um, something that's not a usual question that we get, you know, as a doctor or just, just the basic background that, that our CV can give you. Sure. Yeah. So I asked, I actually, I mean, I, I still interview every person we hire, just like I did at Nevro. And I had a couple of interviews today. So I always ask people, um, first I ask people like, walk, tell me your story. And I say, like, I, I say the word story specifically, because you want to hear how someone, you know, communicates. And if they take like 20 minutes telling you their story, they're either have bad communications, or, you know, they're too full of themselves. So like, run in the other direction. Um, you want to ask someone like what they're most proud of. And what you want to look for are people who are proud of something that had a positive impact on someone other than themselves. And preferably that I know it's hard for doctors, but like where they were part of a team, you know? So um, why is it hard for doctors? We're always like working on a team. Yeah, on a team in quotes, a lot of it, a lot of it, I mean, a lot of it is individual, a lot of it is your individual yeah, judgment and your individual procedure, and you are part of a team, but, you know, um, but if you're going to put them on an ad board, you want to make sure that they're going to work well with other people. And, you know, so you kind of want to hear that they've had an impact, but they also can, can work well with others. Um, I ask in people this question, but it would be an awkward question to ask a doctor. But what would what do people like? What does your manager or, or your supervisor, or whoever it is, like tell you you can get better at? First, I ask them like, what do they tell you they like the most about you? And everyone answers that question like within a second. Oh, I'm so great! They tell me I'm smart and I work hard and I do all these things. What would they tell you you can get better at? And then there's a long silence. <laughs> um, <laughs> And really, I don't really care what it is that that person has to get better at. What I'm looking for is an honest answer. So I had someone I interviewed today and she said, well, my boss says I work too hard. And I was like, really, I've never met a boss that tells someone that they work too hard. That seems like not a real answer. And I said, do you want to take another shot of, of giving, giving me a, a better answer? And she gave me a better answer. And I was like, you know, I don't really care what it is that you work on What or what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to hire exceptional people and I'm trying to give them room to do what they do best every day. To do that, I need to trust that when you're in a situation where you have to make a difficult decision that you always do the right thing. So if in an interview where you feel a little bit maybe pressure, you can't do the right thing, like you can't say something critical about yourself, you're probably not going to do the right thing when there's like real pressure of something like going wrong. So I really need to make sure that the people we hire don't have a problem to saying to the CEO something wrong. Cause when something goes wrong, like I need to know, and you need to be able to tell me, right? So some version of that question is really important to me. And if someone doesn't give me an honest answer and I give them a second chance and they don't give me an honest answer, we won't hire them. Uh, I don't care how good they are because it, it, the worst kind of person, I forget there's a framework for this is the competent and like um, uh, unscrupulous, like someone who's who's smart and has no ethics is like the most dangerous kind of person. <laughs> you're, like if you're incompetent and you have no ethics, it's fine. Like you're probably not going to do that much damage. But if you're like competent and you have no ethics, that's a dangerous situation. So you want to avoid those people at all costs. What's um what have you seen in um let's talk about your previous company? You know, you brought it from from 30 something to over a thousand employees. Um 
how many, what percentage of women did you end up hiring comparing to men? And we're talking about just, you know, just women. That's, that's the topic of the day. You know, we can. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think we're, I'm trying to remember the, the numbers. We're about 50% women overall. What was really unique about Nevro is that over, a little over 40% of our technical people are all women. So our engineers, um, our operations people, like those kind of folks, which was, that's really hard to do. Um, yeah, so I, I think a third of our management team were women. We're trying to, to improve that. Um, yeah, I think those were kind of the, but even directors, our director percentage was higher than that too, I think. Um, so we had, we, we were obviously pretty good, but always trying to improve. And at our Salix, the numbers are, um, are, you know, are even better than that from a board perspective and, um, from a scientist perspective, uh, they're pretty, pretty remarkable, both from a gender equity and as well as a, just an overall diversity perspective. When you have somebody who's coming to you. Like you said, do you have any questions, right? Which are interesting questions somebody who comes to interview with you would, would make? What sort of things are you wanting us to ask you as a physician who's being considered for the board? Besides worse, you know, the break room. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I would start with like, what's the vision of the organization? Like, where, where are you hoping to go? Um, what's the culture like? What's important to you in this role? Um, what are you looking for in this role? Um, you know, how do you view the competitive landscape? Like, where where do you fit in? Um, some people might be put off by that, but I would ask that question. Um, depending on the company, like, what are the priorities? What are the kind of near near term and long term priorities um, for the organization? What's your leadership style? Like what's your what's your approach? Um, I mean, you can ask a question about diversity specifically. Like, I mean, what is what is the company's stance on diversity? Is it a priority? How do you, you know, um, how do you support women? Or, or, but I think something on diversity along those lines. Because also, if you're going to bring your name and your brand to a, a company you want to make sure it represents your values so a lot of the questions around the vision and the culture and diversity and whatever it is that's important to you you should ask about what's the process to hire somebody in terms of you know like timeline suppose that you say okay this person is wonderful let's interview them what's the process that those people go through to get to our aesthetics right now to the board oh, it's, it's brutal um <laughs> it's a long process it's at least three or four rounds of interviews and each round is four or five people and then they meet with me at the end and part of it is like you know one we want people who really want to be there so we kind of make it hard on purpose and two we want to make sure that like they're consistent because you know, you can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can't fool all of the people all the time kind of thing. So they might be able to have a good day and do a good set of interviews. But by the third time, by the time they meet me, it's like you get the real deal. Like they are just tired and <laughs> you get you get whatever you're going to get. And so um, so it's like and I also like, well, you know what, candidates, we what we Sometimes people like are like, man, our process is so long, maybe we should shorten it. But, you know, we screen out people who are just collecting offers and wasting everyone's time because they're not going to waste time interviewing like three rounds or four rounds to do that. And we get people who really, really want to be there. So our, you know, offer to acceptance rate is super duper high because anyone who's committed that much time is probably going to take your offer. They're not going to, they're not just messing around or you know, there are just people like I had friends like that in business school. They had like 21 internship offers. They're just like professional interviewers, you know. I don't I personally don't want to hire any of them. Like I wouldn't hire anybody who does that. Um, but it's their style, you know, work for them. So as a startup, you don't have that much resource. So if when you up front say, listen, it's really hard to get hired here, it's gonna be multiple rounds. 
you'll just screen out a lot of people. Now, for some companies, that might be a problem because they're hiring generally average people. And so you need a lot of average people. But in our case, um, it was the case in everyone. It's the case at our Celex. Like we only really hire exceptional people. So you don't need that many of them. I mean, our Celex only has 100 people and we're worth a billion and a half dollars. Like we've created a lot of value with only 100 people. And most of that value was created with less than 100 people. Um, so, you know, I feel like if you focus on exceptionalism, um, you don't need that many people anyway. And so you can choose to be selective. So as we end here, surely we're gonna be ending. Is there a particular question that I should have asked you that I haven't asked you so far to get to work in the boardroom as a female physician? That's a good question. You know, the only thing that I didn't cover um, is that recruiters also play a pretty big role in, in life in general. And I, I probably myself didn't value that enough. So I think spending time getting to know them um, is important. Um, and I think the biggest thing, I guess, is just, you know, sometimes you have these goals and like, it's like a little bit like the dog that chases the car and then you catch it and you don't know what to do with it. Like, so make sure like that's what you want to do. I'm personally not on any boards and I get called for board roles like every day up to and including today. And I don't really have any interest in doing it um, because I've been on a lot of boards and it's not as sexy or fun as people think. It's a lot of work. <laughs> and like, I love my job. I mean, you know, I'm choosing to do it and it's hard, but it's super fun. And I love the people I work with, but that's a little unfair because I get to control who I work with. Um, and I love, like, you know, I love my family and I love going to the gym and playing sports and doing the things I like. And I really don't feel like taking away any time from any of those three things to sit on a board and to get on an extra flight somewhere. So maybe the thing you didn't ask me is like, would you get on boards if, if you could? And I could be on a lot of boards and I choose not to do it. So now if Disney called me, I would probably go on that board. But like short of some, you know, miraculous company that I just out or Porsche or something that I or Martin guitars, something that I really, you really love. Superman right now. I saw the Superman right there. Yeah, that's right. The soup, my Superman pill pillows. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, it cannot be a meeting without <laughs> Superman. <laughs> One so question I didn't ask you is like, you know, regarding that is time and compensation. For somebody who sits on an advisory board. Yeah, so that's a great question. So time, um, usually advisory boards, you will have like one or two meetings in person a year. So that will require travel. And those are usually half day, all day meetings. A lot of times they're like, for example, like at Nevro, we would do, and we just did it our Celix, right? Like we would do it like a day before like um, NANS or something like that. And and maybe one other day during the year. Um, and so it, well, you wind up having to yeah, fly and you know leave home and all of that. Maybe post COVID people are doing them virtually, I don't know. But um, and then, then what winds up happening is once you're on the board, like certain people on the board like might be helpful for different things, right? So within our ad boards, like some people are better in research and so our clinical team is working with them offline like via phone call throughout the year. Some people are better at marketing. And so you're getting them to review your marketing materials and giving you help on that kind of stuff. And so that tends to happen in the background, not so much travel. Um, the compensation uh, depends. So if you join a company that's private, oftentimes you can get equity for your um, um, like stock options for your role. Um, and if you join a company that's more developed, you tend to, you can like it for sure. If you join a public company, you're not getting any stock. Otherwise, like the, the company has no compliance or governance, but, um, but you should be getting cash compensation. One trick I've, I've seen like some of the more experienced physicians, um, use to, to, to negotiate compensation. They'll look at who's on the advisory board already and they'll say, well, just give me what you gave this person. 
So they like, you now you're putting the, now they can't like a little bit like screw you because they gave this other doctor a lot more than you and they're not giving you the same because you're a woman. So I, I, I like that. The person who I actually heard that from was a guy and he was asking about another guy. <laughs> um, but it's an interesting trick that I found. I was like, oh, that's clever. Um, but you know, like there are sunshine reporting and all these kind of things. So one thing you can do is go to sunshine.gov. You can look up the company and you can see how much it's paying the consultants that it's already using. So that's another trick you can use, or you can just look up people's names, specifically other doctors in your field and see how much companies are paying them. So you can get a general sense of what the compensation is, um, for your field. You know, generally speaking, it's something on the order of like, I don't know, maybe times have changed, but, you know, it's like five hundred, six hundred dollars an hour or something like that. I feel like I don't remember exactly. Um, and yeah, I think it's higher if you're like a neurosurgeon, because a lot like there's like these spreadsheets and compliance that like you fill in like the credentials of the physician and it like spits out a number. Um, so there's a lot of like compliance around that stuff, but I would say like, use those two tools, use sunshine reporting and use the trick of saying, Hey, well, you know, I'll just take whatever you're giving everyone else. <laughs> take a picture of the person, bring yeah. a picture. Do you know this guy? Oh yeah. I know. I want what they're making. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Get an autograph picture from them too. To take the boardroom. Okay, well, thank you very much for being here. I know that you've been gracious with your time. Um, thank you for all you've done to bring equity to our uh, field um, in pain management, which is where I met and what you're um, doing now in, in the cancer world. And I look forward to more of you, you know, with time. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was a, It's always a pleasure to see you. I enjoyed the conversation and definitely keep in touch. Thank you. Right, take care. Have a great night. Well, guys, that's it for today. I hope that you had as much fun as I did talking to Rami Elgandora. You can actually find him through his LinkedIn account, Rami Elgandora. I hope that you enjoyed and you actually subscribe to our podcast, share it with your friends and family and give us five stars. We'll see you then next time. See you. Bye. Please remember that design is not providing specific financial, medical, or career advice. Our only intent is to stimulate your appetite for growth by sharing our experience and those of our speakers, coaches, and guests. Your personal growth and success will be unique to your circumstances and your hard work. We sincerely hope you enjoyed the show and look forward to seeing you next week.